Yes and no. I understand, you know, uh, is that better? I don't know where my pocket is, but uh, I have a hearing issue too. You know, we really uh, need somebody to be raised up with the gift of healing to heal old age. <laughs> One guy I know said, if it isn't hurting, it isn't working. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, thing is, we uh, get to do this. Amen. You know, the alternative to old age isn't that good either. I'm just saying. <clears throat> no, uh, if any of you are having trouble hearing and you want to move up somehow, I can't project any more than, than this uh, right now. But uh, one of the reasons I have to sit in the back during worship and all is I've just done my ears in over the years. Yeah, I flew jet aircraft for a long time. That does something to your ears. And then sitting in front of sound systems for years. And, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, we can be healed of those things. And, uh, but I'm one of those that believes you get healed and then act on your healing. There's, uh, I, I don't want to go there, but uh, I believe we walk in truth. And uh, I had my knees healed four times. And each time they got so bad. Now, I've got, I did stuff to my knees. I've got what are called catcher's knees. I was a catcher when I played baseball. And uh, they do stuff to your knees. And I haven't had cartilage in my knees for 40 years. I mean, I have zero. And then the Lord would touch them and heal them where they would act like new for years, and still he didn't replace the cartilage. It just felt good. And uh, he did that four times until I got disobedient. And I did something. I'd made a commitment to the Lord that I wouldn't do. And uh, he, uh, anyway, let me know that. I was unaware of it. I had made a commitment I would not take trips or go places that he had not really sent me. And I took a couple of engagements in Europe because a lot of my good friends, I wanted to see them. And I didn't even think about it, but I'd, I'd gone to this thing. I would pray, and I, I wouldn't take an invitation unless I'd heard from the Lord. I'm supposed to go. And uh, anyway, I did this, and the day before my trip, I got out of bed and couldn't walk. All of a sudden, my knees were unhealed. And I said, Lord, what's going on? And he let me know. I said, well, will you heal them again? He said, no. And, uh, and you may have trouble with that theology. I know people say, well, that's not a very positive confession to confess that you're not healed. I said, no, I'm positive I'm not healed. <laughs> I'm positive I can be. And I'm also positive there are times when the Lord gives you a thorn in the flesh, and it's usually in the flesh or something else that you need a restraint in your life. Now, he may heal my knees again. Uh, thank him for the four times he did. And uh, he may do it again, but he, if he doesn't, I'm just as good. I have had the hardest year in my life physically since last July, and it has been the best year of my life ever in every other way. Best year spiritually. I'll do the trade. You know, it really was, since 2014, every year has gotten better, and not just a little bit better, but much better. And uh, I keep getting concerned about being penalized in heaven because I've had it so good here. <laughs> and uh, I just, you know, I really do wonder how can it get any better? 
So, uh, but anyway, I've, uh, I've been just so thrilled. And, but I want to talk a little bit tonight about, I think, the opportunity all of us have to receive and walk in the most important anointing there will ever be on the earth. The most important. And uh, I want to lay a little bit of a groundwork for it, okay? Listen, you don't need a theology degree. You don't need... Uh, you don't even need to be in leadership in your church. You don't even need to be an usher. You can be used to do some of the most spectacular things that are going to be done in these times. In fact, I think the Lord loves to use those who nobody else expects. He loves to do that. And, uh, but I think, you know, those who are some of the best known people on earth are some of the least known people in heaven. The things that get our attention here are not necessarily very impressive in heaven. And some of those who have the most attention in heaven have the least down here. Now, it shouldn't be that way, but we're kind of out of whack with the Lord. And uh, he's constantly doing things to try to get our attention so that we can come into uni unity with him and abide in him. Where we would actually think his thoughts, be like him, and do the works that he did. And that's what he's called every one of us to. To be like him and do the works that he did. So, you know, in Luke 19, Jesus says, if you had known in this day the things that would make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the day shall come upon you when your enemies will throw up a bank before you and surround you and hem you in on every side and will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. That was the second worst judgment of God that has come upon the earth. And then the next word is because. And he's telling them why this is going to happen. Of course, he's talking about Jerusalem. This is why this is going to happen to them. Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. I think that is one of the most serious mistakes we can make. Because it reveals how far out of whack we are with God if we don't recognize the time of our visitation. So to me, one of the most important devotions that we have is to recognize him when he comes, whoever he comes through. He, told us, he said, from now on, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in my name. So he said, you're not going to see me unless you see me in the ones I send to you. Now, we often think it's the main speaker who's coming or whatever. I tell you, the main way that God may have wanted to meet with you in this whole conference could be in the elevator with somebody. Somebody totally undescript. You don't know. Could have been one of these children. But one of the reasons why, you know, the disciples on the road to Emmaus could not recognize him when he appeared to them, it says he appeared to them in a different form. And I think one of the number one reasons why we don't recognize him when he comes to us is he very often comes in a form we are not used to. He does that for a reason. He's trying to break us out of this old wineskin mentality where if we're charismatic, we're expecting God to be a charismatic. You know, and one of the things he's going to do, if you're charismatic, 
he'll probably come to you as a Baptist. <laughs> and if you're a Baptist, God forbid he could come as a Catholic. <laughs> and we tend to miss him because we want him to come in the form we're used to. That's why the Pharisees missed him. They were sure the Messiah comes, he's got to be a Pharisee. Got to be like us. No, we've got to be like him. But I think he is constantly trying to draw near to us. And we miss him because he is constantly coming in forms that we're not expecting. If they had known him by the Spirit, they would have recognized him right away. They only knew him after the flesh. Paul says from now on we know no man after the flesh but only after the Spirit. Or no, we don't know people after the externals. We shouldn't just know people because they're a Presbyterian or they're a Canadian or an American or a British or whatever. Where we tend to take people because we put them in this category because of the externals. He said, no, from now on, we've got to know people after the Spirit, after their heart, if we're going to recognize Him. I think we've, instead of seeking to hear the words of the Lord, and that's a noble devotion, but we need to seek to hear the Word Himself. Where it's not just hearing His words. When I, you know, the way I recognize somebody is a true pastor, it's not because of their degrees or their training. It's not even by who laid hands on them or ordained them. It's when I see my shepherd in them. I know that's a pastor. The way I know someone's a true teacher is not by how articulate they are or knowledgeable they are, but it's when I hear my teacher in them speaking. I know that is a teacher sent from God. So it's not just hearing the words of the Lord. It's not just about what's going to happen, what you know, can we expect after this and everything. It's hearing the word himself. The only way we're going to do this is follow the lamb. We're called to follow a person. And uh, I think we've got to know his voice. He says, my sheep know my voice. He's in John 10, or he was speaking third person, but he says, Speaking of the good shepherd, his sheep know his voice. And they follow him because they know his voice. You know, I don't know how many ladies there are in here, a few hundred maybe, but, uh, you know, if my wife were in here talking, all of you ladies could be talking, but I know she's right over here. I know it because we've been together so much, so long. And, yeah, I've read a lot of books on knowing the voice of the Lord. I haven't read one yet that I think that I would recommend. It's all about principles and things. That's not how you're going to get to know the voice of the Lord. Listen, I could come in here and technically, perfectly describe to you my wife's voice. You would never be able to recognize her by it. I could tell you she speaks in this many decibels. She's a soprano. She does all that. There are many of them like that. You wouldn't be able to distinguish. But if you had heard her voice, known her for a long time, you would recognize her regardless of all the technical things. Do you know? So the only way we really get to know our shepherd's voice, we've got to be with him. We've got to be with him. So we want to take this seriously. We do not want to miss the day of our visitation. That is a critical, critical matter. Because the way we're going to miss it, either we've been distracted, distorted, or we've elevated or esteemed other things above following him. So, the Lord called them hypocrites who didn't know the signs of the times. He didn't have a high opinion of hypocrites. Okay? We don't want to be a hypocrite. And one of the reasons he called people hypocrites was knowing the signs of the weather better than the signs of the times. And listen, I don't know if you've realized it, weather forecasting's gotten really good. 
really accurate. We still make jokes about them, which they deserved 30 years ago. They could, you could just about count on the weather being something else than they said it would. Today, they're unbelievably, incredibly accurate. I was a professional pilot. I had to fly in the, I was in the weather every day. And uh, it was life or death for me. So this transformation of discerning the signs of the weather is a miraculous and wonderful thing. But we should be, have gotten that much better discerning the signs of the times. We should be mirroring that where we, we have no problem. We, we shouldn't have such a devotion to understand the signs of the time because we know them. We've got that down. Okay, that should be one of the small things we do. But, um, you know, I, you know the, the issue is not, I, I think I would rather know the Lord's voice than have all of the details down and what's going to unfold in the last days. You can know all those details but not be in his will and be in serious trouble. It's not just about knowing those details. But let's give attention to that because we don't want to be a hypocrite. And we want to know the signs of the times. But let's move on and let's, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. The main thing is knowing him, knowing his voice. Okay? Now, <clears throat> Matthew 24, 14, he says, In this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for witness to all nations and then the end shall come. So we know the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached. You know, Jesus, repentance had to be preached before Jesus could come. Repentance prepares the way for it. That's why I think one of the major and devastating uh, deceptions today are those who are teaching you don't need to repent anymore. It's crazy. You know, it's one of the foundational doctrines we're given. Repentance from dead works. Repentance is one of the things. And he does say we don't lay again a foundation of repentance. And some have mistaken that and said, well, you don't repent anymore. Once you've repented, you're good. You don't have to keep repenting. Listen, when you lay a foundation, you don't lay the foundation again, but you walk on it every day. Something you walk in. We've got to have that humility before the Lord that... Ability to be corrected and steered and whatever. That's all about repentance. And repentance prepares the way for the Lord. And we have an open, humble heart, a teachable heart, a correctable heart. He can speak to us. And uh, if we don't have that, we're probably going to miss him. The Pharisees didn't have that. They thought they were already good. They didn't need repentance. Well, I think that's a major delusion. But you know, he does say, he didn't say repent because judgment is coming. He said repent because the kingdom is coming. Do we really understand his kingdom? Do we really know what's going on? I had two phone calls today from different parts of the world that were profound to me revelations of something God is doing in the earth to prepare the way for his coming kingdom. It was shocking to me. Now, I've seen these things unfold. One of them, one, I don't want to get into the details of this, but it was truly a remarkable thing. In all this stuff and clamor that's going on in the news and all about all this conflict with nations, God is doing something behind the scenes that is just unimaginable to bring the nations in preparation for what he's about to do. And uh, I've got a friend, he's a little guy, call him the Hobbit. <laughs> God uses him like the Hobbit. If you ever read the Lord of the Rings, you know, all these big battles going on, all these armies fighting, clashing, God has his little Hobbit slipping in the back door, unraveling the whole thing. Bringing the enemy stronghold down. Mark was used like that. Probably the person most responsible for bringing down the Iron Curtain. 
Nobody, hardly anybody's ever heard of his name. Do you hear what he did and what it accomplished? Perfect person, perfect time. And uh, he also, uh, I don't want to get off too much in the point, but I love these things God is doing with nondescript people. I am going to share something with you, just briefly. This is free. You didn't pay for this. <laughs> but this guy, he was also, uh, he, he's uh, just been used in remarkable ways, but he's the primary person that helped China start its market economy. He helped them set up their stock exchange. He did all kinds of things. He was sent over there by, first by President Reagan, then President Bush, and and uh, he's one of those guys, just gets stuff done. And he's kept a relationship. He became very close to Deng Xiaoping, and, uh, who was the one who said when he retired as the head of China, when he was asked, what is the main thing you want for your country? He said, I want my country to become a Christian nation. That was recorded in Time magazine. And then he, when he gave the reasons for it, it was one of the most profound revelations of the kingdom you can imagine. And I think God is doing something in China. I, I tell you, something truly remarkable is going on in China, but you're not going to read about it in the media. And, uh, but we need to discern the times of what are really going on. Okay, a few months ago, Mark calls me one day, and he's still in touch with probably world economics more than anybody else I know. He was an associate of Milton Friedman, if you know who Milton Friedman was. But uh, Mark is known throughout the world by many world leaders as the person who may be most knowledgeable of what's really going on in world finance and world economics. And uh, he consults with nations. Okay, well, he calls me and he says, the... Uh, China's about to have a meltdown. Their whole, whole economy is about to melt down. And Mark had warned them about some things. If they didn't take care of them, they're going to have to face some issues. There's going to be a meltdown of their yuan, and their, everything they built is going to collapse. And Mark called me and said, <clears throat> it's happening. I can see the signs. It's happening. I said, well, what can we do? He said, I don't know. He said, but we need to warn people this could be a world economic collapse. China collapsed, second biggest economy in the world now. The whole world is going down the tube. I said, can you still get in touch with the leaders? He said, I don't know. I said, well, see if you can, and then call me back. So he, he did, and he called me back a couple of hours later, and he said, I got right through to the leaders. And he said, I said, well, what happened? He said, I told him, I know what's going on with you. I know what's going on. Can I help you? And this is the thing, this is what we're here. The Holy Spirit's the helper. I don't care. They may be in a mess because of foolishness, not listening to the Lord and everything else, but the Holy Spirit's nature still come. How can I help you? He's the helper. And they said, we need a meeting with Trump. So Mark calls me. He says, can you set up a meeting with Trump? I said, I don't know. I said, what? He said, he, Trump is the only one. America is the only one that can help China. The U.S. is the only one because of the strengthening of our stock market after Trump got elected. Strengthening of our dollar. He said, we're the only one that can go in and help them so their yuan does not collapse. And uh, he said, can you set up a meeting with Trump? And I just said, Mark, you know, he's, he calls me and downloads for hours at a time. He's really educated me on a lot of these things. But he wanted to download all this on Trump. I said, that isn't going to work. I said, you've got to put it in two pages, bullet points only. He said, I can't do that. It's too much. I said, you've got to do it. Two pages, bullet points only, because I've... No, I know he's not going to read a book on this, but he'll get it with the bullet points if we say it right. Well, anyway, I called a friend of Trump, Donald Trump's, 
who's one of his best friends, and I just said, we got to get something in the hands of Trump. And he said, what is it? And I started telling him, he said, I don't want to know all that. This guy, this friend of Trump, hates politics, hates everything. He didn't want to hear it, doesn't want to know it. And uh, he just, he says, can you put it in two pages, bullet points only? I'm having dinner with Trump tomorrow night. I'll give it to him. If you can get it in two pages, bullet points only. I said, it's in your email box. I've already sent it to you. <laughs> and so he took it, gave it to Trump, became the talking points and helped set up that meeting between she, she and Donald Trump. Donald Trump used Mark's bullet points for that old meeting. And the whole world's totally unaware of how close we came to a worldwide economic collapse. And I tell you, I don't care what you think about Trump. I don't think there's another human being in the world who could have read those bullet points, grasped right away what this means and what we can do about it, and call and make the effort. And then he invites him to his personal place at mar lago that could not have been more offensive to the Chinese. Trump didn't know that. But they would only meet with other leaders in their highest government buildings. Mark used to have dinner with the head of China. It'd be the two of them at a table with their translators in the middle of the Great Hall of China. And that's the only way they would meet an official. And when Trump invited him to his personal residence, it's like, it couldn't have been... He came. That shows how desperate that situation was. Didn't make any deal out of it. He and Trump actually liked each other, bonded together somehow. Now, I added my own bullet point to that. I said, we need to ask that the only thing we need from China is they've got to help fix this thing with North Korea. Because that really was the most dangerous situation in the whole world. And it is really far more dangerous than most people understand about all the economics. This was really, really dangerous and headed towards a really bad, I think millions of people could have been lost. And uh, Trump added his own bullet point on the end. The only thing he was going to require of China for helping them out in this situation was they are going to have to help bring, rein in North Korea and they were going to have to stop persecuting the Christians in China. Trump added that himself. <clears throat> now, Trump may not have, he probably doesn't have a clue who Mark Nuttall is. May not have known that came from me. I don't care. He, J.J. may have just given it to him. He may have thought J.J. No, he wouldn't have thought that. I don't want to give you this guy's name, but yeah. He's a great guy and brilliant guy in business. But, uh, but stuff happens. I tell you, some of the most important things in the world are going on behind the scenes. Nobody knows about it. And it's changing the nations. And much of it, like what happened today, uh, in some ways, I don't, uh, in some of these nations, in an alignment that maybe some major breakthroughs happen today. To me, it's a part of the Isaiah 40 preparing the way for the Lord. How do, you, how do we prepare the way for the Lord? We build a highway. It says building a highway, and God's highway is God's higher way. And I tell you, this whole highway that is aligning incredible nations all over the earth is going to bring the same amount of justice and influence on the poorest, weakest nations as it will the mighty. Part of that preparing the way is bringing the mountains and hills down and raising up the valleys and low places. But I could just have seen this thing unfold over several years. And to me, like it's really happening, it's really coming together. The Lord has a whole different economic system than the systems of the world. It's being built right in our midst. It's a kingdom thing. And uh, it really is going to bring justice. And we don't have justice until it's justice for all. Where the poorest and the weakest have the same justice, are treated as fairly 
as somebody who's maybe powerful and, and wealthy or anything else. God cares deeply about justice. He says in Isaiah 89, righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. We've got to have both. And God's up to something. He's doing all kinds of things, but we've got to have eyes to see. Not everybody needs to see that kind of stuff. It's kind of a realm the Lord's called me to, and, but you don't need to bother. Well, you don't want to know all this stuff about what's going on with the you on or anything, but you want to know your part. And your part could be a whole lot more important than stuff going on. You know, uh, we want to know our part. We want to do our part. We want to be in our place. And we're only going to do that if we know his voice and we follow him because we know his voice. So, you know, knowing the time of our visitation, being sensitive to hear not just the words of the Lord, but the word himself. Through, ever, through whomever he chooses to use. Now, I think there are a lot of things that are, we're going to see time made up. We're going to see a lot of people that may, you may feel like I've spent 30, 40 years in the faith and I just haven't gotten very far. And it's true, you haven't. <laughs> 40 years, we should be doing better. <laughs> you know, let's face it. That's called repentance. Let's face reality. And uh, <clears throat> by the way, I may be the greatest sinner you've ever seen. Not because of what I did before, but because of what I'm, I am right now. I really have come to grips with that. And I'm being serious. What am I doing so bad? Nothing that you would probably think is that bad. I've never been unfaithful to my wife. I've never, a lot of stuff everybody thinks is bad. But I tell you what, I have seen the Lord so many times. I have seen the most incredible things, glorious things. This past month, I have just had some of the greatest encounters and revelations I've ever had. They're getting better. This is getting way better. I should be better than I am. I shouldn't be as impatient as I am. I shouldn't be. You know, Paul the Apostle said he was the greatest of sinners. Guess what? That's scripture. That means that was true. Now, how was it? I think, you know, now he started out saying, I'm not inferior to the most eminent apostles, which means I'm one of the greatest. Six years later, he writes in another letter, I'm the least of the apostles. Six years later, he says, I'm the least of the saints. And then in one of his last letters, he says, I'm the greatest of sinners. Do you see a progression there? <laughs> With true maturity, there is true humility. I think Paul was getting more and more in touch with reality. And when he was saying he had this thorn in the flesh and all because of these great revelations and all, so he wouldn't exalt. But he was also, I think, he really was the greatest sinner of the time because he should have been better. Should have been better. But guess what? Lord grades on a curve. You realize that? It grades on a curve. But let's understand God's standard of judgment. And by the way, people are saying today, I heard a friend of mine, a good friend, I love this guy, was saying God doesn't judge anymore. He isn't judged since the cross. That was the last judgment. Well, how about this thing I read in here that he said to Jerusalem? How about... Let's go on right on up to the end of the book of Revelation. You know, that doctrine makes total sense until you read your Bible. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying, bless their hearts. <laughs> but let's look at God's standard of judgment. He said to some of the most righteous cities maybe in history, in Israel, they were so righteous, they would stone somebody just caught in an, an adultery. We flaunt it today. Sell it. We do everything we can. 
with the things that God calls abominations. We fall into the ultimate depravity. He spoke of in Isaiah 5 when we start calling good evil and evil good. Start honoring the dishonorable and dishonoring the honorable. He calls that an ultimate depravity. And that's where we are, the nations are today. Guess what? It happened on our watch. Where was the salt? Where was the light? I don't blame the nations. They're just doing what heathen do. If I were a heathen, I'd be in the middle of it. But he said to some of the most righteous cities there in Israel, Sodom is going to have it easier in the judgment than you are. Because if the works had been done in you, had been done in them, they would remain to this day. They would have repented. Listen, there is no bigger evil, no worse stronghold than self-righteousness. And so the standard of judgment or the standard that is going to determine the level of judgment, the degree of judgment, it's not by how evil people are, but it's the amount of light that they reject it. How much light have we been given? When I think of the, you know, you know, I'm just saying, when I think of the experiences that I've been blessed to have, the, the relationship with the Lord I've been blessed to have, I can't look at any sinner out there doing the worst stuff and claim, you know, I'm not going to condemn them. We've got to find a way to help save them. You know, we cannot, it's not, we don't want to see the world condemned. We want to see them saved. God wants to see them saved. But listen, they keep doing that stuff. Wrath is coming. Destruction is coming. Stuff, he is, he's made it very clear. There's certain limits where after that he will judge the nation. And we tend to think, I know in a, the American church, the U.S. church, we tend to think, well, we're giving so much money to world missions, we're giving like 0.1 tenth of 1% to world missions. It happens to be a lot because there's so many people down there. But it's tiny compared to what we should be doing. But we think we're, we're so, God has to use us. He have, listen, he could raise up the tiniest nation in the world to do his will. He doesn't need America. I think he wants to use us. He doesn't need Canada. I think he wants to use Canada. You know, but I think we've got to align with him. But we really need to start with some repentance. How much have we done with the light we've been given? How much have we really been transformed? And now, let's move on a little bit to the most important anointing, not just for these times, but for all time. It's coming. The most important anointing ever to come upon the earth that will be until the end of this age. It's available to you. It's available to anyone here, anyone who wants it bad enough. I call it the Eliezer anointing. Remember Eliezer? Abraham sent him to get a bride for his son. Theologians and, and all for years have considered Eliezer one of the greatest types of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. He went bearing gifts. He had gifts. He never talked about himself. Now think of what he did. Think of the anointing on this guy, Eliezer. He comes, meets this young girl and persuades her to leave everyone she's ever known and loved, everything she's ever known and loved, everything, to go meet a guy she didn't even know what he looked like. She couldn't FaceTime him. <laughs> she didn't know what he looked like. I mean, she, 
But somehow this guy, Eliezer, did such a job causing her to fall in love with the bridegroom. And it was never, it's not these gifts are coming from me. These are from my master. And then on the journey back, somehow he imparts such a love for Isaac that when she spots him in the field, she couldn't stand any longer. She leaps off her camel. There's an Eliezer anointing coming to cause the bride to so desire the bridegroom. She's going to leave everything, do whatever it takes to be with him. There's an anointing coming to compel people to love the Lord. And this, you know, it says the bride makes herself ready. And then it says, you know, you know when he comes back? When the bride says come. There's something when she has such a desire, she can't stand it any longer. He's not going to be able to stand it any longer. He's coming for a bride. Listen, there are many awesome things and we're called to do and be a part of preparing the way for the Lord, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and all this too. But this is the most important thing. Are people being led to the Lord or are they just being led to us? It's about us, our gifts, our programs, our, all this stuff, our church. What good is the most glorious temple if there's no God in it? And if God is in it, it doesn't matter how glorious it is, it's not going to be the temple to get your attention. If the temple's getting all the attention, where's God? And that's the title of my message tonight, Where's God? Here we have him in Revelation 3.20, knocking on the door of his own church, seeing if anybody will open to him. Here's God. It's his church. And he's outside knocking to see if anybody will open. In this age, he's not going to come where he's not wanted. I had this friend one time. He, he's a pastor, well-known pastor, and he said this woman in his church came to him. She had two sons that were incorrigible. She couldn't do anything with them. So he said, bring them in, bring them in here. They were like 9 and 11 years old. He says, bring them in, I'll talk to them. So she brought him into the pastor's office and sits him down in the chairs in front of him and he just stares at him for a few minutes. Then all he says is, where's God? He stares some more. Then he raises his voice. Where's God? <laughs> Those kids, he said they jumped up, fled out of his office, ran down the hall. It's two blocks before they stopped. <laughs> and the little boy tugging on his big brothers. Why are we running? Why are we running? He says, you don't know? God's missing and they're blaming us for it. You know, I love the prophetic, love prophetic people. I love the edgy people. I really do. I, lo I love out of the box, edgy people. I just do. I'm drawn to them. Maybe, it's, maybe I am one. Maybe I'm, <laughs> you know. But I really like that type of person. And, uh, but, you know, Jonah was kind of a character like that. But I think he's more representative of where we are today than many of the other prophets we would like to claim. Here he is running from his purpose. And he brings judgment upon the ship. The, 
the judgment, the storm didn't come because of the heathen. It came because of the wayward prophet. Remember, his standard judgment is the amount of light rejected. And here you have the heathen having to wake up the prophet and tell him, call on your God. I think that's what's going on today. I think the prophet, his church, is running as hard as they can the other direction from their calling. We've got to make a turn. And a lot of the stuff that's coming on the world, it's to wake up God's people. Let's don't blame the heathen. Let's don't say what they're doing is right. That's never going to bring repentance. You're not going to be able to be politically correct and represent God. People are not going to like you if you tell the truth. It's not about them liking us. It's not why we're here. Paul said, if I were still seeking to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. We've got to discern. Who do we want to like us, people or God? We've got a choice to make. But above all, the only way we're going to get where we are, our main job description is loving God. It's the main thing we're here. It's the only thing that really determines if we're maturing or not, are we getting closer to him? Are we loving him more? And only when we do that will we be able to love one another the way we're supposed to. That's our main job description. Are we drawing closer to him? And listen, he's scary. I mean, he just spoke, and Israel says, Moses, don't let him ever do that again. You go up and hear from him and come tell us. I think a lot of Christians, we want to hire a pastor, we want to hire somebody else to hear from God for us. And... But are we going to draw near? There's an anointing coming for those who draw near. Those who truly draw near, who are in pursuit of God, not pursuit of a ministry, not pursuit of influence, any, they want God. There's an anointing coming of imparting a love for God. That Eliezer anointed so that we become so contagious with the love of God, we infect everybody we come in contact with. You know, there's nothing in this world more attractive than a person who's getting closer to God. Nothing more than that. Thank God for all the stuff that's going on and everything, but where's God? Where's his glory? Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 3, we're supposed to be experiencing more glory than Moses did and he had to put a veil over his face to keep from scaring people with the glory. Where's God? Have you ever been in a meeting with his manifest presence? I've only been in a handful my whole life. And uh, the first one, I'm going to end with this, just tell you a little story. I realize a lot of this I've repeated. I'm trying to drive some things home. Water seeds. and But I was a young Christian, brand new young pastor. I was the worst pastor I've ever heard of. <laughs> Still to this day, I think nobody was that bad. And uh, I was a pastor of mostly college students from University of North Carolina, NC State, and Duke. And I was living there in what was called Research Triangle and had this little church, almost all college students, a few other crazy people that joined us. But uh, I was young. I'd only known the Lord two years. And they asked me to be their pastor, and I didn't. Listen, I, that should not have ever happened. But anyway, it did happen. I was there. And this some people I'd heard about since I'd become a Christian were going to do this conference at this little church in this little town in eastern North Carolina. 
And I went just to hear them, hear these speakers. And they had bought this old Baptist church or whatever, and they were turning it into a Pentecostal church. And this was kind of like the meeting that's going to commission this church. And uh, they were hoping to get all kinds of people out from the town to come to this meeting because of their well-known speakers. They only got two little old ladies from the town who had never been in a Pentecostal or Charismatic meeting before. Never. And the first meeting, it was the driest meeting I've ever been to in my life. You know, there are levels of dryness to meetings. <laughs> this one was off the scale. It was so bad. I brought some of our young congregation to it, and it was so bad, we were going to go home. And I said, let's just stay for one more meeting. And, and it was really good. One of the best meetings I've ever been in, but I'd only been a Christian for two years. I said, let's stay for the evening. It was the most powerful meeting I had ever been in by far. And each meeting was getting better. The next morning, it was way better. Next afternoon, I was a scheduled speaker, and I couldn't go. I got in the pulpit. I couldn't say anything. I felt like the biggest idiot you could ever imagine. I felt like if you could imagine being a world-renowned authority on a certain famous person that you'd never met, and then you're going to give this uh, speech on this person, and you get there, and that person's sitting on the front row, you'd feel pretty stupid. God's presence was so manifest there, I felt like I don't even know him. I've only, I felt like Job. I've only known him by the hearing of the ear. Now my eyes see him. I repent. I felt like the most presumptuous person in the world to get up and try to say anything about him. I knew so little. And that's true. I was young. I just, But I could not talk. And the presence was building. And all of a sudden, a golden glow came into the room. Filled the room. Started up around the, the, the ceiling, and it grew and grew, and then it started pulsating like a heartbeat. <laughs> and one of those little old ladies, never been in a Pentecostal or charismatic, she jumps up and she goes, it's God! And everybody hit the decks. Everybody. <laughs> I am, that was the first case of carpet burn I've ever heard of. <laughs> and we were all flat on our faces, laid there for hours. Now, I didn't know it was hours. I really couldn't tell if we'd been there for minutes or hours. It was so intense. You know what I did that whole time? I was trying the hardest I could not to think a thought. Because I thought I would think something unclean, I'm just going up in smoke. <laughs> it was that intense. My wife, I didn't even know it until a few years ago. She said, I didn't see the, the glory. I said, what? How did you miss? How could you not see? She said, I was afraid to open my eyes. I knew he was there. I couldn't open my eyes. It was one of the most intense. I've, I mean, it was the most intense in a corporate meeting that I've ever had, the presence of the Lord came. But we literally laid there, went right through the next meal, and whatever we laid there for, it turned out to have been hours. We were on the deck. And then, all of a sudden, it changed, it lifted, and a spirit of prophecy fell. And these two little ladies, never even been in a meeting like this before, sound like Isaiah and Jeremiah. They were... Everybody was prophesying on a level. You don't prophesy in the flesh in the presence of the Lord. I remember one of those little ladies came up to me afterwards and said, these are really good meetings. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going, yes, God comes to our meetings, you know. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> you know what he told us? He said, this is normal. This is the way church is supposed to be. He said, where well, you come in and his presence is so strong, we should be on our knees crawling to her. You know, and if you've ever been in something, we've had a few encounters like that in conferences and all where something's 
uh, in a manifest presence of the Lord would come. Nobody remembers anything else. One of the most spectacular was after we prayed, Lord, we asked for the greatest anointing we've ever had on the, the messages, on the worship, on the ministry, the miracles, the healing, the prophecy. We asked for the greatest anointing we've ever had on everything. But we ask you to come in such a way nobody leaves talking about the messages, about the anoint, the worship, or anything else. They leave talking about you. We didn't know how he was going to do it. That's the one where that cloud appeared in the middle of the stage right in the last session. Up until that time, everybody were left talking how awesome the worship was, how awesome. Because it was. It was on a scale we never even conceived of ever reaching. Everything was. That one little thing at the end, nobody left talking about us. And it's the best we ever had. Isn't that the way it's supposed to be? Well, when we come and, and we leave, bring people to the Lord, they really get Him. Not just meetings. We've got to have the glory. And he wouldn't have said that in his words, 2 Corinthians 3, if it wasn't available. We're supposed to be experiencing more glory than Moses did. I think that's why he was 120 years old. He didn't have all the issues I have. His hearing didn't go down. His eye was not, his eye did not obey. His vision. I don't think, matter of fact, I don't think he would have died unless God had killed him. I don't think he could have died. He had too much life in him. God, God, the only way he could die was God had to take him. He had spent so much time in the presence. That's available to anyone here. And it's not just at church. That's one place I think there's a way we are to experience his presence together. But our personal time should be even better than that. And that is available. We are all, right now, tonight, as close to God as we want to be. He put it on us. If you seek, you will find. You draw near, he will draw near to you. How bad do we want him? What would happen if we all got this anointing? And all of a sudden, it's all about Jesus. Isn't that the apostolic gospel? Read the gospel they preached in the first century, which I don't think has been preached since. It says they pre preached Jesus Christ and the resurrection from the dead. Are we preaching Jesus? Or just stuff, things about stuff, even good things? Even good things. His things, his truths. To me, that's a message of uh, John 6. When the crowds were following him because of the signs he performed, then he multiplies the, the bread and the fish, and then it says they were following him because of, he was feeding them. And, you know, if you want a big crowd, preach, you know, do the signs. That'll draw big crowds, and those are good. We want more of them, not less. Or preach God's provision. That will draw a lot of people. But then he said, unless you eat my flesh. You know, when it came down to just him, it says even many of his disciples departed. We're not walking with him anymore. People want to, well, they want the stuff. They want the excitement, the miracles. They want the provision. But when it comes down to just Jesus, there weren't many left. What was the message there? What did they have left over after he fed the multitude? He said they had fragments, 12 baskets of fragments. What does the church look like? I think those loaves represent truths that are truth. They're God's truth. They're important, but they're not the main thing, and we've made them the main thing. If we're just going to feed off of the individual truths of God, we're going to end up as fragmented as we are now. 
Then he said, I am the bread. We partake of him. We're not going to have all this fragment. And if we serve him, the manna that came from heaven, where he is our food. He is our food. What do we have better to do? Every one of you here, any one of you here, you can be an Eliezer. And I think when we get there on that judgment day, one of the things we're going to want to hear the most is how we led people to the Lord and helped the bride fall so in love with her bridegroom she couldn't stand anymore. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen.